You are now listening to the Add 10 Gallons Concrete Podcast. Wait, the answer was Add 10 Gallons? Add 10 Gallons. My first thought was, we got to put Axe in. Yeah, great. <laughs> Trucks on the, on the way. On the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I've got two observations, uh, neither of which are really educated or well thought out. <laughs> which are like most of my observations are. There aren't a lot of problems on a job site that can't be solved with a sack full of biscuits. Today's episode of the Add 10 Gallons Concrete Podcast is brought to you by Actigel 208. Actigel 208 is a high-performance additive for the concrete industry that is greatly beneficial to the producer. It enables them to increase the percentage of manufactured sand by up to 100% and completely replace all the natural sand in the mix. In areas where natural sand is scarce, inconsistent, and expensive, this provides a huge benefit to any ready-mix company out there. Benefits of manufactured sand and concrete include consistent air content, improved compaction, and increased density. Now in the past, the downside of using manufactured sands was that they were hard to pump, hard to place, and hard to finish. Well, Actigel 208 solves all those issues. By improving suspension, stability, and the quality of the cement paste in the mix, Actigel overcomes the old issues with manufactured sand and leaves them behind. Let Actigel 208 improve the quality of your mix while saving money on every yard you produce. For more information, visit us at actigel.com. That's A-C-T-I-G-E-L dot com. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to the Add 10 Gallons Concrete Podcast. I'm Josh, your host, joined as always by Paul and Joey. Paul, what's going on? Oh, glad to be back, brother. Same, same. Joey, what's good? Oh, everything's good, man. Nice. Well, we're coming to you here for the 20th regularly scheduled episode, and we have Alex Forrester from Argos USA here. Uh, He is the head of their value-added specialty products division, and we'll get deep into that because I'm sure he's seen all the snake oils out there, and he's seen all the cool stuff that actually works, and he's been around long enough to see trends come and go, and as our friend Jim Casilio said, we're inbred elephants in in this industry, and we never forget anything, and we've all worked at the same company at one point or another, so that's what that meant. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, we'll get into all of that. But first, we got stuff going on around the country. The last current event section, we talked about uh, a condo collapsing. So hopefully, we got some better news for y'all on this one. Paul, you got something better or <laughs> baby steps? <laughs> <laughs> baby steps. Oh, brought the whole place down last time. So this is another story of an epic collapse, but this one's hilarious. <laughs> So we've got uh, a truck crashed into a Georgia bridge, and it was like a bridge overpass, crashed into it and moved the entire thing six feet off center. (laughs) It's the most insane thing you've ever seen. That's like a hockey goal, like when they they crash into a hockey net and it just like breaks away and slides across the ice. (laughs) (laughs) That is exactly what the pictures look like. So this guy was like a semi-truck but had a you know dump on it and the dump was filled with uh look like tractor tires mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so he's hauling these old tractor tires and i don't know what happened it they don't know yet uh the reporting by the way is you know local cbs fox stations everybody for this i-16 bridge they're all reporting it looks like the dump came up i doubt he was riding with it up so i don't know what exactly happened nobody knows yet but it came up enough that it struck the bridge and thankfully, the driver's unharmed. Nobody that was on the bridge is harmed. But the entire bridge just slammed six feet to the left. So GDOT was like, well, guess we're going to have to close this bridge down, demolish it. The demolishing happens July 21st. And they're just going to rebuild the whole thing from scratch. In the meantime, it is a 23-mile detour on uh, I-16 whew. because of this bridge. Oof. Mm-mm. Both directions shut down. Oh, that's my next question. Yeah, yeah, because the overpass covers all four or five lanes of this highway or whatever. Yeah. Shut down both directions, 23-mile redirect to get around this section of interstate. Uh, this is I-16 going between Macon and Savannah. And when you see the overhead pictures of the bridge just shifted <laughs> like six feet, it's just the craziest thing. 
Well, for our listeners here, the trailer looked like, I don't know, maybe a maybe a 30-yard dumpster, maybe smaller than that. It was about a 20-foot long, what was basically an open-top dumpster, but it was connected to this truck body, and it had a hydraulic ram up front, so it would actually tilt like a dump bed. And it had maybe a half dozen tractor tires mounted on wheels on the back of it, um, probably going to get recycled or, or what have you. They look pretty used. But I know guys, when they park their truck overnight, they put a little bit of an angle on those trailers to let the water run out so you don't get water to pull. Mm -hmm. Um, And that might have been what he did. So it was probably not all the way up, probably up just enough to catch that bridge. That might have been what happened. Or, I mean, it's not very common for hydraulic cylinders to malfunction and actually raise things up. If anything, they collapse. Mm -hmm. So it's probably driver error. It's probably, I'm 95% sure it's driver (laughs) error. I'm surprised you're giving him 5%. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say we can give old boy benefit of the doubt. Maybe 5% is all the benefit of the doubt he's going to get. But yeah. You wonder how long those guys that have accidents like this, you know, because I've seen a handful of videos of trucks going down the road with their dump beds up. Like I saw, I've seen one video, it was like a truckload of corn or soybeans or something, and it hit an interstate overpass, and it just exploded. You know, just stuff went everywhere. But you wonder Mm -hmm. how long they're on the road before an accident like that happens, and somebody doesn't, like, notify them. You would think somebody would be, like, honking their horn beside of them, something. I don't know. It's... That's weird to me that even stuff like that even happen. It shouldn't happen, to your point. I mean, unless you're the only one on the road. But say there's one person on the road and you notice somebody's dump trailers up. Like, that's that's a cause for laying on the horn. Mm-hmm. I just can't believe nobody was hurt. Yeah. you see the pictures of this. And you, you'd think that driver was messed up. you think there's people on the bridge. They're messed up. Uh, but miraculously, nobody was hurt in this whole thing. Unbelievable. Yeah. Now, they're not given any schedule to when this thing's going to be back open. I mean, uh, when you look at the pictures, it looks like it was uh, steel beams, you know, with concrete poured for the paving. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't know if they're going to do a precast bridge or they're going to change it up. If they're going to go with steel. It could be closed a long time. Yeah, for sure. Well, if they don't want to close very long, they can call Gage Brothers Concrete Products. They're members of the Precast Concrete Institute, PCI, and uh, they got a little pat on the back from the PCI Institute and a few and a few news articles around the country. But essentially, earlier this year, during the whole COVID pandemic, there's a lot of N95 masks that need to be manufactured. So 3M, of all companies, of course, they got a contract to build a bunch of them. Um, so they needed to up their manufacturing plant in South Dakota, and they wanted to add on 440,000 square feet of production. So this started for Gage Brothers. They got the contract to do the work for this expansion project. So between April 30th and July 17th, they manufactured 200 24-inch deep double tees, 60 36 inch deep double t's 60 regular beams 72 24 inch square columns and 182 10 foot wide wall panels all within april 30th to july 17th shipped them out that job's about to be done in about a month and a half god almighty yep so pat on the back good job good job gage man we were just talking to some people in central pennsylvania that are doing like these wall these insulated wall panels and stuff and they're expanding from four lines to six lines as these cast they actually cast theirs on the ground uh, and just cut them up to whatever length they need but they're doing nothing but warehouses they can't keep up with amazon and walmart and whoever else just all the warehouses going down i-95 i mean just incredible amount of stuff so it's cool to hear other people are doing the same thing just in this case building out a plant like right. 3m cool. yeah yeah you see so many so many warehouses being built up and i do a lot of traveling from my personal hobby west and east and north and south and you hit a major trucking route whether it be 95 or 81 here on the east coast you see a lot of warehouses being built i mean next to the next to the highway that's all you see being built it's crazy mm-hmm yeah, they're popping up. I see them a lot of Murfreesboro, Paul. You know, they've they got an Amazon place there, and they they uh, they built I don't know how many more just around in that area. Like y'all said, they're just popping up everywhere. I didn't know they had an Amazon 
facility in Murfreesboro. Yeah. Yeah, Jimmy McQueen, of all people, worked there for a little while. He's got a pretty good story. Shout out, Jimmy. He's got, I've got a pretty good story about him that I cannot tell on air. <laughs> <laughs> One day we're going to create Add 10 After Hours and we can tell all these stories. Yeah. Add 10 minutes after dark. <laughs> <laughs> Add 10 after dark. That's a great name. And with that, fellas, uh, let's see what Joey's bringing to the table. Yeah, uh, I was nosing around looking for something to talk about and came across this uh, piece of equipment. It's a uh, it's a telebelt that hooks on the back of a concrete mixer, and I think we've all been on job sites where there has been you know belt placed concrete where it's they don't pump it or anything. Uh, the concrete mixer discharges on this conveyor and it just sends concrete. I don't know, 40, 50 feet in some cases, and it gets dropped in the form or just whatever they got all over there. And uh, this article actually highlighted a couple different companies. Uh, Rotabelt, R-O-T-A-B-E-L-T, that's one company. Atlas Polar is another one. And uh, Westcon Manufacturing. The uh, This article in Concrete Products highlighted those companies as uh, you know kind of the leaders or innovators in this product and they're pretty interesting maybe we can throw some pictures up uh we'll have young jamie uh pull that up for us and uh these <laughs> <laughs> these uh these belts they hook on to the back of the concrete mixer like i said and they kind of they're articulate enough where they kind of fold over the front of the uh, mixer and so it's you know of course they can go down the road with them and everything else uh, but I just thought it was pretty neat instead of, you know, hooking on, I don't know how many shoots, you know, on the end of the, on the end of the mixer there, and then discharging that into a wheelbarrow or the Georgia buggies or whatever else that guys use. They have this telebelt hooked right on the back of the truck and it just, it can just sling at concrete like 50 feet away. I think uh, some of these booms are. Uh, between 47 or 42, 57 feet. There's one that's 52 feet. So we're floating around the 50 something foot mark. Um, and uh, I think it's it's going to cut out, you know, some of these small jobs where either if, if they can't or don't want to transport concrete from the truck via wheelbarrow or Georgia buggy, that'll save on an expense of renting a line pump or something of that nature and getting concrete into some someplace um, they can just send this conveyor over everything they won't tear up the ground they won't have to worry about clearing a path or anything like that like it'll come right out of the truck onto that belt and they can place it wherever they want to so i thought that was pretty cool you know given like i said that we've seen other jobs where they would have to use a line pump or a separate uh, conveyor like you would a pump company for instance uh, those same companies have those tele- have those belts, those conveyor belts. So that would save you some expense, and you could probably charge a premium for that for having your own equipment to place that concrete. No, oh, there you go. You got to imagine it'd be easier to operate that tele belt than having to operate a line pump. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because you could place a low slump concrete uh, with this belt. I mean, you could place you could place RCC with a belt. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be flowable. It just has to be able to come out of the truck. And then once it gets to wherever, you know, they can do vibrate it or do whatever they want with it. But you don't have to worry about, you know, having a pumpable mix to send 40 feet away from where the truck's going to be or easily workable or whatever. You can just send it right out there. Yeah, that's a good point, because the whole entire time you were talking about the conveyor, I was thinking to myself, I was like, well, how does this compete with the pump guys, and how are the pump guys going to perceive this kind of stuff? But, I mean, there's, I think there's enough room for both to exist without either one really recognizing the other one's there. If you use these conveyors to move concrete extended distances that you wouldn't be able to pump anyway, then everyone's happy. No one's really eating off each other's plate. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, this piece said they're like 40, 50 foot reaches so i mean typically if you're going to get a pump you're going to be pumping a lot further well yeah than 40 feet so i think this is probably for those jobs that are in between like you know i don't need to hook up you know i can't hook up 10 shoot extensions uh, but i do need to place 40 feet away so now i gotta order a pump have the people that can operate the pump rent that operate that 
it's just adding cost, it's adding time. And if you can get away from that and you can do it quickly and efficiently and the dude's just playing with a remote control, because <laughs> I mean, that's how these are being operated. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. a little joystick remote control and, you know, seems pretty uh, pretty efficient to me. I, You know, we've seen guys use telebelts for, you know, big pay, like dams and stuff like that, uh, RCC. I've not seen anybody use it for, like, traditional ready mix like this. But it makes sense. I mean, this one, uh, they're highlighting Atlas Polar. And you can see this photo where that makes a lot of sense where this guy is doing new home construction. And so there's not really any roads. And so the truck just got as close as he could. And there's, just like, hills and valleys and dips. It's like, you know what, I'm not going to try and navigate through that. But I could just convey over it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's only 25 feet or so. I mean, that makes total sense. Pretty cool. Good find, Joey. I got to imagine Telebelt's going to be easier to work with, easier to maintain. Even if it breaks, it's probably easier to fix. Never met a happy pump guy. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. No. <laughs> I mean, yes, you have. Every time you put ActaGel into a pump. Well, that's it- after. <laughs> that's after. I said I've never met a happy pump guy. I know a few now, but uh, we didn't meet like that. <laughs> Smooth recovery, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, let's, let's tell the people, people uh, we have our new YouTube channel, and we'll be having a new video coming out this week on our new YouTube channel. We will. Pretty excited about that. We are going to be doing uh, some skits, some promotional videos, some how-to videos. We're going to be utilizing our new YouTube channel as a platform for something that, you know, kind of promotes the podcast. We'll have some podcast-related media on there, but we're also going to do some ActaGel 208-related media and then just some overall how-to, ad ten pod brand-building uh, media. But uh, what you guys can look forward to is uh, an informational skit, a how-to, if you will, of how to use more manufactured sand in your concrete and using ActaGel 208 to overcome some of the difficulties you may have had or run into when trying to push the boundaries of manufactured sand in the past. So we had a lot of fun making it. It was a good time. It was actually more fun than I thought it'd be, actually. I was into it. Halfway through the day, I felt like a producer. But <laughs> it was good. Yeah, it should be good. I'm hoping to bring that uh, add 10 flavor to some concrete videos, get a good laugh out of it, make fun of ourselves a little bit, but also learn along the way. And uh, that's what add 10 does. Yeah. Well, in in this particular skit, Joey Bell had to had to play a job site foreman, if if you want to call him that, and uh, it, it's comedy gold. It might. I want us to eventually one day get so big that Joey's character can turn into an internet meme, because it wouldn't be hard to do. <laughs> Not that character. <laughs> easy, easy meme material there. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. The hardest part about all these skits is going to be just us getting together in the same place because it, it worked out because I was up at the Sparks office, at corporate office, you know, for other things that we were doing. And then uh, Paul came in that morning and was like, hey, I got this great idea of how we could promote this and make this video. And so we just, you know, took off from there and we worked out, we worked all day on it and it was awesome. Um and then for the next one, I guess we'll try to do in August when we're all together down in Georgia. And so I, I guess we'll just make it a point. Anytime we're all in the same place, we need to shoot some kind of video. <laughs> just so I, you know, I'm not making any special trips or anything like that. Because that's, that's how the production value gets high. Because, you know, um, it costs a lot to, you know, to send me places, you know, where I'm needed. And, uh, <laughs> First class tickets. That's right. Yeah, you, Joey Bell goes, you don't see me often, but when you do, it's worth it. That's right. <laughs> Better make it worth it anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think the videos uh, when it's done, I think it's just turn out really well. It's I, I think it's hilarious. And, you know, I appreciate you guys being willing to uh, poke fun at yourselves a little bit. We all did. We all did. It's, it turns out pretty good. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but about eight o'clock in the morning, Paul Finley busts through the door. Guys, I got this great idea. Joey, you're gonna throw a hard hat at me, and we're gonna film it. That's <laughs> <laughs> pretty much what happened. It snowballed. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully, you know, as people watch these, they give us more ideas uh, for other yeah. things, uh, topics or whatever or something. Yeah, and I know there's some people that, uh, like Will Banks, for example, knows that this is coming. And he he wants to be a part of one. Oh, that's like, cool. He, yeah, he'd love to 
be a part of one. Maybe we do a, a segment of like all the different ways to get cussed out on a job site. Or <laughs> <laughs> have the beat button handy for that one. All right, boys, let's bring in our guest. We have Alex Forrester, as aforementioned, the guest for today. Uh, he works with Argos USA in their value-added specialty products division, so we're going to have a lot of questions for him. Uh, he's familiar with the ActiGel product, but he's also familiar with literally anything else that they've ever come up with that you can put into concrete. So his job is an interesting one. He's an interesting guy. He's been around for a while, so we're definitely going to tap into the experience and the knowledge that he has. So for episode 20, this is Alex Forrester. All right, I'd like to welcome in our guest. We've got Alex Forrester of Argos USA. He is the Value Added Specialty Program Manager. He manages all the VASPs. These are products that enhance their ReadyMix offering and their cement line. Alex, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, we've been looking forward to this this podcast here for a couple of days now. Oh, yeah, this is going to be a good one. You and I go back years. Uh, we've been on a lot of job sites together, trained a lot of people together, uh, so this should be good. I'd like to take a moment, though, and uh, go back to how you got here because your path into the concrete industry is different from a lot of the other guests mm -hmm. we've had. You actually came from the wine distribution business and then crossed over into concrete. How on earth did you do that? Well, it's funny. I, I, I started with, uh, in my, my work life, doing YMCA work. I, wanted, I was a rec major and a minor in business and, and doing YMCA work. So I realized that all my buddies were bypassing me by thousands, tens of thousands of dollars a year. And I was, I was like, well, I want to do something else. So I went into uh, pharmaceutical sales for uh, a small pharmaceutical company out of Winston-Salem owned by Goody's Headache Powders, which is Miss Ann Spencer. Uh, stayed with them a while. We were bought four and a half years into, into it. We were bought out. And then I had a, a pretty good severance and some time to look around. So I ended up landing in the spirits and wine wholesale business. That meant I was, I was covering, I, I managed sales reps throughout the country and I was covering uh, 68 reps nationwide, 4,000 wine labels, 2,500 spirit labels that you needed to know the ins and outs of all those products to be able to sell them, obviously, So and push those through our reps. So, And every vendor was important. you know. So when you think about every vendor, uh, you know, with VASPs, I've got like 10 that I deal with for our VASPs. And just think about 6,000, you know, different labels. And they want, they want, each one of them want their label to sell. So I ended up having, uh, I met my wife, Carmen, and uh, uh, we, we had a couple boys. And then I was struggling with, not that when you're in that business, you don't do a lot of drinking, believe it or not. You hardly do any. Uh, you're, you're too busy pushing products. So, you know, but it was still tugging at me that I was in an industry that, that you know, when the church doors are open, well, my wife is in there and I applaud her for that. And so I started looking around for another marketing opportunity along that I could still push product. And... Uh, Lafarge at the time, before Argos acquired Lafarge, I found out about a marketing opportunity there. They were thinking about doing something with uh, value-added products. They didn't know how they were going to do it, what to do. And so I, I was intrigued. They were intrigued by me, and uh, it was a marriage. And then when Argos uh, purchased uh, Lafarge, we continued Lafarge's value-added program through Argos. And um, it's it's just been, it's been good. It's been profitable for for the company, it's been profitable for our customers, introducing new product to our customers. And so, you know, I use some of the things that I, I learned in those other industries, specifically spirits and wine, in the fact that, and Paul, you and I and Josh have done it in Florida, in the fact that you got to let them taste the product. In order to sell a, a spirit or wine, they got to taste it. And if they like the taste, they're going to buy it. Well, just like we did for an example at Crom in Florida, we had to get them to taste it. And, and that's what we did. We got them to taste the product. So teaching the ready mix industry how to sell something other than 3,000, 4,000 PSI concrete is not easy. It's a culture change. So 18 years of, of continuously battling culture change and still do it today the same way, still battle the same roadblocks and culture change is tough. But when our reps do move a VASP product, they, they do feel the feeling from their customer that they've helped them save time. Uh, and that's what VASP stand for. I mean, if you can't save time on a project, 
you really don't have anything to take back to the customer. Because at the end of the day, all of them should save time. And if you can quantify that time, now you've got a value proposition. Once you have a value proposition, then you can place a, a fair number that's fair to your company and fair to the customer and then move forward and everybody, and everybody wins. So that's kind of, sorry, that's kind of a long story, but that's how we got all got started in this thing. No, no, that's great. So you and I were actually at LaForge at the same time. You were just in Atlanta when I was in Kansas City. So I saw what they were doing out there trying to sell branded products and then moved away from these branded mix designs to switch over to VASPs. And during that time, uh, innovation was the key word, and Argos carried that through. So when I eventually met you back in, what, 2013 or 2014, that it was a, a natural segue for those companies, Lafarge and then Argos. And then it was interesting that we got to work together, and we created you know different kinds of concretes and stuccos and all kinds of stuff. We had a good time. But what I really kind of wanted to get into on your side of it is how do you select what products gain access to your VASP program? Uh, that's a good question, Paul, because, you know, we're inundated. Uh, when people find out, uh, admix suppliers and material suppliers and so forth, find out that, you know, we do have a VASP program and there's, a, there's an avenue to maybe push more product, you know, we get a lot of calls, um, as you can imagine. Uh, but what we do is we look for products that will save our customer time we look for companies that have a long-standing history in performance, good performance. Uh, we don't want anybody that hasn't been around, and this is a flash in the pan. So we we take about 18 months. When we see a product that we think is going to take a, take a customer to the next level and is really going to provide a solution to a customer, we take about 18 months with our supplier uh, of a product, and we spend time in the lab. We, we put up every single scenario you could possibly think of, uh, and then we take it to the field, and we field trial it, and we see if the, the we see what the acceptability is for the customer. But it, it first starts with that qualifying the vendor. You know, what is their product? Is it a viable solution? And if we believe it is a viable solution, we test it. If we like the testing, then we move forward into a marketing campaign for that product. So it's not easy to get in. Believe it or not, you'd think it'd be really easy to get in, and it's not because there's a lot of background that we 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 fall in to looking at with our vendors that we bring on board, not only just in product, uh, but in the company that you are. Uh, and that, that, that means as much as the product to us. So that's, that's kind of how we do that. Oh, that's, that's interesting, Alex. So you're building a partnership there while qualifying the product. But uh, if you could just kind of give a ballpark, I know you guys are inundated with opportunities what what's the what's the ratio what's the percentage of products that come across your desk how many of them make it to uh, the final stage of becoming a VASP for you guys well we use a uh, a tried and true method stage gate uh, that we go through and stage gate is designed for everything to fail if you can make it through stage stage gate you really have something going so josh i would say less than 1% make it through to 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 get in there I was thinking that it had to be that because he said he's got 10 and yeah, I, I mean, he's got to get a hundred a year. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's a uh, it, stage case designed uh, to, to get a thumbs down. And if you get a thumbs up, you're really on to something. So that's kind of the, 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 the ratio. And then we look at, at how we measure our sales uh, of those products and how we measure mm-hmm. our sales is it's a, is the percentage of total volume that uh, we will put goals in that but it's the percentage of total volume that really tells us how well we're doing in the market so we know that our VASPs provide solutions but you can't just go out and arbitrarily offer it everything it has it's a niche product so it has to meet a product or, or a customer that has a specific problem and we've got a solution and if our solution is one of our VSPs, we plug it in. We don't drive it down people's throat. It's something that really kind of happens naturally, to be honest with you. So we look at a percentage of our total volume of sales, of our cubic yards sold. A percentage of that has to be, is a goal that we set for our ReadyMix team that we must meet for the U.S. region uh, each year. How do you go about incentivizing uh, your ReadyMix sales guy? You have it as a goal, but I imagine there's an incentive as well. And if- and I'm not asking you to give me like what their compensation is, but 
uh, we've talked a lot about how to build this, and we've got listeners in this audience um, who are going to be interested in building their own mm-hmm. VASP product uh, product line and their own program, and you've given them a lot of clues about how to get set up in this. So what's a way to incentivize your guy to do the opposite of what you mentioned earlier, what you fought 18 years to break away from, mm-hmm. which is selling just 3,000, 4,000 PSI concrete? Well, you base it, uh, you know, you, you can devise any sort of a of hundred different uh, ways to incentivize guys. And without going deep into ours, our, our guys are incentivized by the total experience that our customer has with our company. So it's not just on the sale, it's on the, it's on the delivery, it's on the, the uh, customer experience. So the customer doesn't have any problem writing a check for that particular job because it went so well. So ours is based on the experience. So it gets you away from just arbitrarily just selling and moving on and selling and moving on. It makes you go back and service that solution that you're selling to the customer. Being there, making sure that quality understands, making sure that best practices are followed at the plant and by the drivers. So when that when that solution is uh, realized by the customer, then you're eligible for an incentive. If you're just out just selling and, and, and not servicing, then it's really not the whole package. So we're, it's based on the incentive, the incentive is based on the entire package and the experience that our customer has with, with Argos. And it has to be that way. So anybody that's thinking about this, it can't just be based on sales. It has to be based on sales and service. That's a great point. And so as someone tries to build this out, they uh, they track how well they're doing through the products that actually make it through whatever their own stage gate process is. And then they implement it, and then they service their customers. Uh, that allows for follow-up. And, and to really gauge success of these products as well to make sure you want to keep using them in the marketplace. Uh, but we've mostly mostly focused on the ready mix side when I've talked with you. Um, are there, is there also a, a VASP program for the cement side? Somewhat. Uh, I, I, I'm, we've been looking in recently into how to really expand that. But we do have cement specialty products, mostly in our bag products and our mortar offering and so forth. Uh, as far as that goes, and we have gotten into here recently white cement that is a uh, is considered a cement specialty product, but not to the not to the tune that we've done in ready mix. Right. right. Hey, that uh, that white cement. Are you making that locally in Georgia? We're bringing it through Newberry. No, we're we're bringing it uh, from Cartagena into Newberry and and so forth. You know, Tampa and Atlanta. You know, are, are the, the the main areas, and you can imagine Florida being a, a hot market because of the the paver market and and so forth that's in in Florida and and the need for white cement and so many different things. So it's new, uh, it's emerging, but uh, we have a leader, Enrique, that that is doing a really good job. So we'll see how that we'll see how that thing grows over there. You mentioned uh, emerging technology there. We talk about technology on this podcast all the time. All the things that excite us, we have people on from companies that have exciting technology. And so I'm wondering from you, what do you see as some of the most exciting technology? Maybe you're not repping it, but you're seeing it and you're excited about it in the ready mix business. Well, just in the, just the amount of new, uh, you know, all the companies now are, when I say the companies, I mean, mostly the ad mix suppliers are, are, are really into uh, new products and new fibers and new uh, high range and mid range and super P's are just evolving to just make it so much easier to create a mixture that can that can provide a solution. I mean, and and because the 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 ad mix companies have have you know they they've joined in. They've always been value add, but I think they've really started to hone in on on really perfecting mixes to the point where all of them are good. All the admix companies are good. And I mean the competitiveness with with those guys because they've all they've all realized the innovation piece. And uh, and they all have their own niches uh, and they all have their 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 wonderful labs and people in their labs. They're all just creating just really really good stuff right now. And uh and we're excited, as you can imagine, to, to see it. Yeah, us too. I mean, we see it everywhere we go, uh, some of these products. And 
really what helps uh, the better admix companies in certain regions is just how strong their technical guys are. Yep. Some of these admix guys, I mean, their technical team is top notch. Absolutely, absolutely, and and they've learned a little bit. I don't know that I don't. I wouldn't say that they've particularly learned it from us, but they've learned that it's not just in walk in the corporate office and put a PowerPoint up and 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 sell product. They've learned to get out in the field and get in front of customers and 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 let them taste it and see it and feel it. Uh, and that's uh that's really something neat that I've seen. All suppliers, but mostly your 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 admix suppliers that that really get it. I mean, you guys get it. Right when I met you uh, at Active Minerals, and you and Josh, we immediately went to the field. You know, obviously we 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 told them a little bit about it, but we immediately went to the field, and that's where it's sold. It is in the field, and I think the uh, the admix suppliers are starting to realize that as well. A sales presentation is okay. That's good. That's part of what we have to do sometimes. But when you take it to the field, now you can really see the benefits. Yeah, that's right. And there ain't hardly a job site we go on these days that we're trialing Actigel, and there ain't a admix guy on that site as well. And he's oh, got yeah. his pickup truck and his wheelbarrow and his air pot, and he's ready to rock and roll. We're about to go head to head. Let's get this thing done, and <laughs> you know, let the chips fall where they may. That's almost every job site now, um, and so. That, yeah, they stepped up their service, they stepped up their product line, and the guys that have the strongest technical team uh, typically went out when uh, they're going head-to-head with each other. We're talking about Grace, the BSF, yep. Sika, Euclid, Creso, these guys. You know, it's really kind of how strong is your service aspect, yep. uh, not just the product line. Exactly, exactly, Paul. And 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 in today's world, it better be that way. I mean, you better be service oriented. And uh, if you're not, they're going to pass you because the the other guys have realized the service aspect of it, and uh, and are making our customers really happy because they're, they're not only are they willing to show new things. If there's a glitch, they don't hesitate now to go in and, and make it right. So it's a uh, it's a win win for 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 us, for the admix company, and for our customers. Hey, let me ask you about something that was in the news down in Georgia. I don't know if you had a chance to see this. Uh, we didn't talk about this ahead of time, so I apologize if you haven't seen it. But let me ask you about the uh, the bridge, the I-16 bridge, where that like dump truck just ran right into the dang thing and knocked it six feet off the of center. Did you see that? I saw that on the news, and the first thing I thought was, who was that engineer? <laughs> Whose concrete was that? You know, what was the uh, you know it made me think what who who's the you know what was behind that you know how, how does that even happen so yeah I've been intrigued by that to, to learn more about it yeah us too yeah we saw those photos couldn't believe it I've never seen anything like it it's it's unbelievable really and they're taking it down now and they're looking to rebuild it as fast as possible. So I didn't know if you guys had any plants in that area, if, if you guys are on top of that, because uh, that, that's just a, such a wild story. Well, that's a wild story. And then, of course, the tragedy uh, down in Florida uh, with the collapse of the, of the condo building. And it's a, uh, you know, it, it makes us go back. While tragedy is, is, is terrible, it forces you to go back. I mean, that bridge thing in, on I-16 could have been, you know, a huge tragedy in itself. But it makes us go back as an industry and hopefully uh, change codes because, we, in my opinion, we've gotten uh, a little bit lax on code here in the past few years. I'm a concrete guy. So, you know, when I see a wood building that's four or five stories and it's, and it's all stick built, you know, I, I kind of cringe a little bit. Uh when I see that, especially when we're in entering hurricane season and, and we're in tornado alley, you know, through the southern part of the states. And it uh, it makes me nervous. So, you know, while tragedy is, is horrible and I hate it for those families, I hope it brings people back to the table to say, hey, we need to revisit design and what we're putting in there uh, in these things. Yeah, I can't even believe it's legal to build those big four Five story stick built buildings right next to each other, one after the other, and then in the anywhere on the western half of this country, because those are fire hazards, and they're all going to burn because they're going to jump from one to the next. It's it's absolutely insane, and there are ways for the marketplace to incentivize for things to be built better. It doesn't have to just be 
code. It doesn't have to just be laws or enforcement. Uh, in Alabama, in South Alabama, where hurricanes are a problem there uh, at the Gulf of Mexico, the insurance companies will give you a massive break if you build your residential homes out of concrete rather than uh, having them stick built. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Florida, I I've seen over the years where their code ha has kind of uh, kind of lacks back to stick building in homes, you know, and it used to be you had a certain code within, I think it was a four or five mile radius of the of the sea. And, you know, now that code is kind of eroded away where it's it's much closer again. So um, I just hope that uh, over time, you know, nothing against the wood lobby and, and, and their work, that's what they're that's what they're in business to do. But at the same time, there has to, just like a selling a product, there has to be a happy medium where we're keeping people safe and we're building quality structures. Yeah, well, in Florida, a lot of the homes that I've seen built, uh, the first floor is grout-filled uh, CMUs. Yep. Um, and in fact, I think you guys have a really good grout mix. We do. Where those, I think I think I remember seeing the thing was you guys, right? Where you just they just were pouring it through a pump through one end of the wall and it filled the entire grout wall without even moving the pump. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah, that's one of our, our products and it's self-consolidating, a form of self-consolidating concrete, which is self-consolidating grout. It allows a, a, a customer to finish that wall in a sixteenth of the time than it would take to bucket or, or, or you know, fill that thing manually. Uh, you can finish it and move on uh, and, and allow your crew uh, instead of standing there filling a cell of a wall to be moving on to building the next wall or, or moving on to the next house because it, where it may take a crew of five or six or, or more to do it manually, those five or six can leave one behind to hold the pump hose while the other group goes and does and speeds up the project, which obviously saves the customer money over time because he's saving time on the project. So that's how that particular thing works. And, and Thank you for recognizing that. That's one of our, our really good sellers. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it was incredible. I mean, it was a good product. So we like to highlight good technology here. And that was one of it. And it was a mix. And it looked great. A lot of people say they have SCC. It's not real SCC. But I, I saw that pump pour in one spot and it filled an entire wall of a residential home. Yeah. <laughs> it was real. It was real SCC. It looked good. SCC has always been a great technology. Uh, SEC is, has been around since, you know, 1980, brought over uh, from Japan. And it's a, uh, you know, if I were in a contractor's shoes, I would find more ways every day to pour self-consolidating concrete just because it makes my life easier. And it's stronger because the cement factor is obviously higher uh, to make these mixes. So not only are you getting a quality mix that's going to make my job move faster, it's, uh, it's going to be stronger than, than a standard mix. So why aren't they doing that? Well, what what are you seeing? What are why isn't the marketing uh, the market uh, adopting it? Younger builders, younger engineers, younger architects, they get it. They see it. They like the innovation. It's it's the older guys that they've been doing this way for 40 years, son, and I'm going to do it the way I do it and this is the way I'm going to do it and and this is you know, that's kind of, that, that's kind of what you're up against and I mean, unfortunately, you know, you can show them and there it just scares them to death, you know, that they see it and they, they just don't believe it. Um, but the younger folks that are coming up, we're starting to see more and more where that's what they want. Yeah. Let me ask you one other thing. We see the technology of uh, 1L cement, the Portland limestone cement. To us, that is the game changer that's out there right now. And it's not being adopted widely. And that drives us crazy because everybody wants to reduce carbon footprint. Well, here you go. And it's awesome and it works and there's no compromises at all. And yet the market's not adopting it. And we're not sure why. Is there any insight you can give us as to why the ready mix market is not switching over to one else? Cement? Yeah. And it, and it kind of goes along with what I just said about the, the guy that's been doing it a certain way for 40 years, you know, you get a, uh, engineers over the years have gotten comfortable with a specific set of specs or specific mixtures, uh, from companies. So they'll reach up and grab the, their, the same book out of the bookshelf and they'll bring it down and they'll write the same spec. It, it's no fault of theirs. It's just, they know that works 
It has worked, and they're willing, more than willing to stamp it and put their name on it at any given time. It's kind of like pervious concrete. When you read the newspaper, every city in America wants to be the greenest city in America. They'll proclaim, oh, we want to be the most sustainable, greenest city in America. However, when it comes time to build a, put in a pervious concrete system that allows water back into the aquifer through the concrete, but when they realize it's not just a four-inch slab of concrete, that there's a system underneath it that could be four to six inches of sand and, and gravel to, to allow it to filter that water before it enters the aquifer, and they see realize the cost, it gets value engineered out. So, you know, it, it's old hat. 1L uh, will get there because there's enough behind it, people that are going to keep pushing and teaching and pushing and teaching till somebody grabs it and runs with it. And then once some once these first adopters grab it and run with it, I think you're gonna see it move. But you gotta get the you gotta get the guys that have been pouring the same mix for all these years to give it a shot. And and again, see it, feel it, taste it, however we gotta get it through to them is the only way to do it. Yeah, we agree. And we we recognize the other challengers for the Reddit Mix guy. He's got one cement silo. So if he's going to bring in this new product, he's got to use it on every single mix going out the door. And so you've got current projects that are bid to use a certain type of cement. And so you can't just change mid project. So you're going to have to start fresh with everything. That's new submittals. That's, you know, make sure it's good with your ad mixes, make sure it's good with everything. I mean, that's a big conversion. We recognize that, but I, I'm surprised that work hasn't been done. And, you know, we're going to keep promoting that technology here, whether it's coming from Argos or another provider, uh, Portland Limestone Cement. No, we really think that's the future. And, uh, hey, before we get you out of here, got to ask you one big question. We ask us of every guest, what is the craziest thing you've seen on a job site? So the craziest thing one of our guests has told us is that uh, while building a hospital in Florida, a, a meth addict from the mental institute next door got loose and was running naked across the job site. <laughs> so if you could beat that, good luck. No, I, I can't beat that one. I don't think I did see something uh, uh, pretty close. close. You, you, you remember the Jim Carrey movie, uh, uh, Ace Ventura when he was playing, playing like he was playing football. Well, I saw a construction worker come on top of a, a parking garage, he had the, the bra thing. He had the, he he had had the dress, dress. He, he had, had, had his work boots on. He had a safety vest, vest on. But he came running out there and doing the whole Jim Carrey um, football thing on the roof. And, and I was like, man, look, he's, he's not supposed to be here. That's <laughs> oh, my God. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Well, he did the whole skip there. Oh, my gosh. That's so crazy. Wait, but, uh, with our last minute that we have you, uh, got to give you a big roll tide. Hope to see your Georgia dogs, you know, in Atlanta at the end of the season. And uh, we'll look forward to another good matchup. Go dogs. Uh, Love our partnership and let's, let's keep it rolling. Thank you for being a guest on the podcast. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Alex. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Add 10 Gallons Concrete Podcast. Sorry about the last few minutes there. Alex was doing the very best he could throughout the interview with uh, Spotty internet service but he did a great job for us and uh, we look forward to having him back on the program sometime soon uh, in the meantime be sure to look us up on social media check out our facebook instagram and new youtube channel uh, you can find us by searching add 10 gallons or add 10 pod uh, also give us a like and review here on this podcast wherever you get your podcast and tell a friend about us and until next time we'll see you around